we hope and pray that you are blessed by the Word of God as it's preached. As I mentioned, the, the series we're going to be looking at over the course of the next few months, we're calling it Wisdom from Above. We're talking about the wisdom literature in the Bible. These are those sections of Scripture that deal with the practicalities of everyday life. Uh, We think of the Proverbs, we think of Ecclesiastes, uh, Psalms, Job, even James in the New Testament. These are those areas where, where the high and lofty truths of God trickle down into the minutia of our everyday lives. And so this morning, we're going to be looking at Proverbs. Um, We're going to be starting in chapter 1. I'll be with you over the next three weeks, and we're going to look at Proverbs 1 and 2 over the next three weeks. So turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 1, if you would. If you don't know where that is, if you open your Bible to the middle, you'll probably hit Psalms. Proverbs is the next book after that. So if you just keep flipping, you'll hit Psalm 150, and then Proverbs chapter 1 will be right after that. So over these next three weeks, we're going to look at kind of three stages of wisdom. We're going to talk this morning about the beginning of wisdom. Next week, we'll talk about the call of wisdom. And then in week three, we'll talk about the end of wisdom. So I hope uh, you can stick with us these next three weeks uh, as we dig into this. I think it's appropriate that we talk about wisdom. Uh, I think we'd probably all not in agreement that we live in a foolish age, uh, it characterizes, foolishness does, characterizes our leaders, it characterizes a lot of our peers, it characterizes, if we're honest, a lot of our own actions. And what is most needful for so many of us is that we would grow in wisdom. That ability to discern, that ability to make wise decisions, to to see a thing as it is and to act accordingly. And one of the amazing ways God has blessed us is that he has not left us without instructions on how to live wisely. And even here in his very word, he has given us so much wisdom if we would just pay heed. And in fact, uh, just speaking to the value of wisdom, in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 11, it says, Wisdom is better than rubies, and and all the things that may be desired are not to be compared with it. That's a high valuation on wisdom, isn't it? Uh, In chapter 16, it says, how much better to get wisdom than gold, to get insight rather than silver. And this isn't hyperbole. This is Solomon. We we heard in in the scripture reading this morning about Solomon's wisdom. He's the author of Proverbs. And he's saying, if you get anything, get wisdom. Get wisdom. And so this morning, we're going to look at the path of wisdom how to find the path of wisdom, how to stay on the path of wisdom. And we're going to do that through four keys. And this will be our outline for this morning. Uh, The first key to find and stay on the path of wisdom is the guide. And this is right here in verse one. Uh, We need a guide, don't we? Uh, This whole metaphor of a pathway is rich throughout Proverbs, where it speaks of wisdom as a pathway. And if you've ever I guess walked anywhere, you know what a pathway is. (laughs) But it's a common refrain throughout the scriptures. Even Jesus calls himself the way. There's this idea of that there is a correct way to go. If you ever go hiking, there's a well-worn path. You want to get on the path and you want to stay on the path, right? You don't want to wander off into the brambles and and the poison ivy and the snakes. I remember uh, one time, My wife and I, we used to live on the West Coast. We lived in California for several years. And we used to love to go to the national parks. And one of our favorites was Zion National Park. Have you guys ever been to, who's been to Zion? Oh, it's great. It is, if you guys ever get a chance, you've got to go there. But uh, there's all kinds of trails and different hikes you can do in the park. But this one year we went, we uh, went on a excursion outside of the park to do a slot canyon. So that's like those really beautiful canyons that have been carved into the sandstone. And you can kind of squeeze through there. You pell down the ropes. And we got a guide, right? Because we didn't know how to do that. We would still be there today (laughs) if we didn't have a guide. But we especially needed a guide this day because when uh, we went to uh, hire the guide to take us out to the slot canyons, they said, okay, it's this much to to go and do the tour and then this much. And we'll pick you up at the end and we'll, we'll take you back so you don't have to hike out. We said, well, okay, we'll, we'll, just, we'll just pay for that. We're, we're strong. We're fit. We can hike out. 
Little did we know, no one had ever opted to forego the pickup at the end. Our guide, guide, had never hiked out before. There was no path. So we get to the end of it, and we come out the end, and we say, okay, where do we go? And he said, ah. Uh. <laughs> and so we just start bushwhacking it. He says, all right, we go this way. And then we would go a lot this way and say, ah, and then we'd retrace our steps. It took us a long time. Some tears were shed. It was a hot day, but we made it out. And even this guy, thankfully, he was experienced in the backcountry. He, he knew how to find his way out of a place even he had never been before. So we were in, in safe hands. But boy, are we glad we had a guide. And we need a guide. If we want to get on the path of wisdom, if we want to live wise lives in this world, wise lives in, in light of even eternity, we need someone who's going to help us get and stay on the path. And thankfully, we have here in Proverbs the wisest guide of all. In fact, I'll say the wisest guides of all. Look at verse 1. It says, this is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. Solomon, as, as we were in the scripture reading, wisest man in all of Israel. He, he had divine wisdom from God. He led Israel through this profound golden age of prosperity and, and justice. And, and he was just this incredible leader God had set up there. And he was so wise. And he is the principal author of these sayings that are in this book of Proverbs. And he also collected Proverbs and he arranged them to pass down to teach others wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, uh, Chapter 12, verse 9, it says, Besides being wise, the preacher, that's a, a pseudonym for Solomon, he also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. And so this is, this is the product of that. Even, even uh, we heard he had 3,000 proverbs. And so he, he was not just wise. He didn't just hoard it all for himself. He said, I want to teach God's people to be wise. And God, in his wonderful province, providence and, and inspiring the scriptures, has left us here not just the wisdom of a wise man from ancient times, but this is the inspired word of God. And so it would be wonderful enough if I could go talk to a wise person from ancient times, right? I'd love to talk to, to Marcus Aurelius or someone like this. I'd love to hear just from Solomon his thoughts. But we have the wisdom of God under the inspiration of God in the scriptures. And all that is to say, this is a faithful guide to wisdom. We might know wise people. We might learn from mentors. We might grow from people who are around us who are wise, and we do well to pay heed to that. But here especially, should we take counsel, here especially do we find a faithful guide on the path of wisdom. And these are contained in, in Proverbs. Uh, a proverb is, is just a wise saying. Uh, the, these first nine chapters of Proverbs may be a little bit different. When you think of Proverbs, you think of the very short little couplets, these very short little pithy sayings, you know, like something your dad might say to you, you know, burn the hands worth two in the bush. And a lot of, a lot of the Proverbs are like that, but actually the first nine chapters are these long discourses. And so there's different types of, of Proverbs that come in different form, but really what they are is, is I like to think of them as truth concentrate, Right? I remember when I was a kid, my mom would buy those cans of, of frozen orange juice concentrate, put them in the freezer, and you get a, a thing of water, and you put the, the orange concentrate, and you mix it up. Ah, it's great. Not so great if you just taste it without mixing it. I remember my brother dared me to do that one time. We, we, he, she had told us to mix up some orange juice. My brother Matt, he said, lick the thing. I was like, I don't want to lick the thing. He said, just lick it. So I licked the orange juice concentrate, and it was like, oh, orange juice overload. It's supposed to be savored. It's supposed to be drawn out. A proverb, a wise saying like this, it's, it's not like a bag of chips that you just want to, you know, eat as fast as you could. I don't advise that either, but you know who we are. Uh, it's like a hard candy that you want to you just turn over in your mouth. You want to think on. You want to meditate on, right? Uh, so even, I'll just give you just by way of counsel, as you read the proverbs for yourself, maybe you're in a Bible reading plan, it's a good place to slow down. You know, you can read some of the narrative portions, some of the stories of Scripture a little bit quicker. Slow down in the Proverbs. That's how they're supposed to be treated. Even Solomon, as I read here in Ecclesiastes, you know, he, he would 
collect these. It said he would weigh them and study them and arrange these Proverbs. He would actually hear these from other people. We have for us actually Proverbs. It was, it was a common literary genre in the ancient world, in the ancient Near East. We have Proverbs still that we found in Akkadian, in Sumerian. There's extended ones even in Egyptian that you can go look up online if you are so interested. And Proverbs, who, who are Solomon, he would hear these and he'd weigh them, and you'll even see some commonalities, but he'd change them. He'd put them into a, a, a worldview that has Yahweh at the center of it. And so he, you have him very selectively saying, how do, I, how do I get the best of these truth concentrates, fix them in one place so that I can hand them to God's people so that they would listen and they'd grow wise? So we need a guide. The first key there to finding and staying on the path of wisdom is finding a guide. And the guide is the scriptures. It's the scriptures. Second, if you want to find and stay on the path of wisdom, you've got to know what the path is, where it's going. And so the path, this is verses two through six. This is kind of an introduction to the book of Proverbs. So we just learned about the author who who wrote these. Why did he do it? Verses two through six explain. And this part was probably written for parents or for teachers who would use the Proverbs to educate Israel's youth. And so it it talks about a little bit through the intended audiences and, and what Proverbs is supposed to do for you in making you wise. So the first thing that the path of wisdom does is it makes us wise. That's, that's obvious, right? Look at verse two. To know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight. These were written for us so that we would know wisdom and instruction, that we'd understand. Wisdom here, it speaks of masterful understanding, of a skill, of expertise. Even outside of the Proverbs, we have this word used in Hebrew uh, in speaking of technical and artistic skill, of diplomacy, of, of decision-making, of, of ruling with cleverness, of, of understanding people and situations, right? What we think of when you think of wisdom, it's this very broad category of, of living well. Some have called it the skill of living, that wisdom is the skill of living. My favorite definition actually comes from J.I. Packer in his book, Knowing God. He says, wisdom is the power to see and the inclination to choose the best and highest goal together with the surest means of attaining it. So, kind of, the, so the, the, what are we doing with wisdom? We're, we're trying to, to get the best and highest goal. That's the first part. So it's the power to see it. So there's a perceptive aspect to wisdom. That, that a wise person would see that is what's best. So it's wisdom to see it. But also it's, it's, it's paired with this volitional aspect in how Packer describes it. as the power to see, but also the inclination to choose, right? It's, it's one thing to be book smart, isn't it? It's another thing to actually have the courage of conviction to take that knowledge and put into action. That's contained in wisdom. And then he says, together with the surest means of attaining it. So not only do you choose the right goal and choose to go after it, you choose a wide way to get there. Isn't that a good definition of wisdom? I thought so too. And so the Proverbs are written to to show us this path to make us wise, but also second, to help us to live righteously. There is a moral dimension to true wisdom. I'll talk about this more in a little bit, but sometimes we think of wisdom, we think of, of people who, we think of it apart from any religious connotation, right? We think, oh, that person's just good at making decisions. And perhaps you've known people who are very wise but don't know the Lord. Um, but the wisdom Solomon's talking about, verse 3, uh, he, this is in order to receive instruction in wise dealing, he said, in righteousness, justice, and equity. Right? It's not just wisdom in the fact that I'm trying to help you be clever, but wisdom in living righteously. Prudent behavior is this wise dealings. That's what that means. To quickly see a situation, grasp the implications, and come up with a plan of action for how to address it. That's what's in mind here. It's good decision making. And so the wisdom that Solomon would have us find here on the path is, is in what's right, in what's just, in what's fair. It's not, it's not the type of wisdom that someone says, hey, I found a shortcut. Here's a way to do this and circumvent the rules. It's the type of wisdom that says, I'm going to stay on the path and follow it completely. I'm not going to try to go around it. I'm going to do what is right. That is part of wisdom too. The third uh, thing that we're taught here on the path of wisdom. So it makes us wise. It's, it's written to help us live righteously, but it also teaches discernment. Look at verse four. 
to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. So actually here, it sort of switches from the student's perspective. So it's, a, it's trying to make you wise. Now it says to give. So it's before it was talking about what does, what does it do for you? And now it's talking from the teacher's perspective. This is going to help you teach the simple or the youth to be wise. And again, here, here's a part, even as I've been studying Proverbs, that I think is an interesting takeaway as a parent. But as anybody, if you, if you teach young people, Proverbs is a textbook. Proverbs is, is something you can use to train up others, right? So if you disciple people, if you have children, use the Proverbs. You know, don't just have the, you can have the dad sayings, fathers. You can have the bird in the hand. You can have those. But memorize a few of these and have those ready on your lips as well. This is the inspired word of God. Why not be ready with wise sayings that come from God's word and to help them to embed them in, in the minds of the youth so that they might grow wise as well as they turn those over for their life. We're introduced with two characters here, and I, I, gotta, I gotta draw these out for you a little bit because this is gonna make sense of the next couple weeks. Do you see how he says in verse four, to give prudence to the simple, so there's one, there's the simple, and knowledge and discretion to the youth. Okay? The simple, this it refers to uh, gullible or naive, right? Who here is simple? I'm not just kidding. But the idea here is, and, and we see this drawn out, we'll look at this more next week. The simple are those who are not yet on the path. So they're not the fool. We'll talk about the fool some more. The fool is somebody who sees the path, is told about the path of wisdom, and rejects it. Says, no, thank you. I've got my own way. The gullible are just kind of like wandering around, right? They're a little bit lost. And so wisdom, we'll look at this more next week, like I said, but wisdom is personified here in the second half of this chapter as crying aloud to the simple and saying, get on the path. And so what they need, it says prudence to the simple. Uh, and, and really this, this word prudence, it really, it's more like shrewdness or cleverness. They need to be made a little less gullible, a little less easily taken advantage of. They need to just get on the path of wisdom. But then it says knowledge and discretion to the youth. And this is our other sort of character that's addressed. And we're going to hear an extended discourse from a father to, to the son who sort of represents the youth here in a minute. But what do the youth need? They need to learn both knowledge, which is sort of a prerequisite for wisdom, right? I got to have the, the information to make the right decision. So they need knowledge and they need discretion, which is to say how to plan prudently not to rush into things, right? But I, I want to draw this out. The youth here, it, it's not just young people. It's, it's youth as a category in contrast to an elder. Does that make sense? So it's saying, so if these people are elders, so these would be the people in the community who are wise, who uh, have, have established themselves, they're mature. What's everybody else? They're the youth. And so the, the youth here, we actually have examples of this term, uh, the young or youth in Hebrew, used in Genesis to refer to someone who's 30 years old. So, guys, if you're 30, you're still young. You got time. Don't worry. <laughs> but, but the reason I say that is, uh, as you read this, you, you're going to identify in Proverbs, especially the first nine chapters, with different characters, Right? It's hard to identify with a simple, but some of us need to do that. <laughs> but maybe you're the youth and you're like, I'm not young. But the youth is the person who, is, who has begun the path of wisdom. They've begun to walk with the Lord, but they need to be encouraged to stay on the path. That's the encouragement. They're still maturing. They're still growing. They're still being established. And what is needful for them, Solomon says, is more knowledge and more discretion for the youth. And the last uh, thing here for the path before we move on to point three is that the Proverbs make us wiser. So I said that they make us wise, but they make us wiser as well. Look at verses five and six. Let the wise hear and increase in learning and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. So y the wise are to hear the Proverbs too. You don't graduate from the school of wisdom. The pathway of wisdom is a lifelong journey. I think it's very easy. Uh, it, you know, the, the, the scriptures, even the Proverbs, speak of those who are older. They speak of old age as a crown. 
is to be respected because as you grow older, you grow in wisdom. You have more experiences. If, if you've been walking with the Lord for a long time, you're hopefully maturing. So the longer that walk, the more mature, right? And that should be respected. But the, 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 the thing that he tells us here for the wise is don't stop growing in wisdom. Don't rest on your laurels. Don't stop walking the path. There is still more to learn. There's still more to grow. And the Proverbs are for you too, not just for the young and for the simple, but for all of us. God gives us wisdom through these Proverbs so that we might find the path and stay on the path of wisdom. But where do you begin? Where do we begin the path of wisdom? Well, you know, I, I like hiking. Used to do a lot more of it before we had kids. But one of the things, if you, if you ever go hiking, the first thing you do is you find the trailhead, right? Often there, there's, a, there's a big placard and it's, it shows you the different loops you can do, how long they are. You can do an easy one. You can do a hard one. There's some different warnings about, hey, watch out for this. But you want to find the trailhead. You don't want to just like start marching through the woods and say, I hope I find the path. You want to find the beginning of it before you start. And this is really the, the center point to the book of Proverbs is verse seven here. Where do you start? Proverbs verse, or chapter one, verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. This is, if you've been in church for any length of time, this is probably a verse you know. One of the issues I think we run into with verses we are very familiar with is familiarity can kind of breed contempt. You kind of, you could, might be able to quote this, but then someone says, what does that mean? And you say, ah, <laughs> not sure exactly. So let's break it down. What is it talking about? It says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And this is always, this, this passage has always kind of been in the back of my mind, something that's bothered me, is if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, how come I know wise people who don't know the Lord? How, what is that, how does that make sense? So let's, let's try to go through this together and see if we can figure out, what does it mean, the fear of the Lord's beginning of knowledge? Well, this first phrase, the fear of the Lord, that appears 21 times in the Old Testament, fear of the Lord. 14 of those are right here in the Proverbs. So again, this is very central to the book of Proverbs, this concept, the fear of the Lord. Specifically, it says the fear of Yahweh. So in your English Bible, it probably has Lord, all caps, L-O-R-D. And that's how they, they translate the Hebrew word Yahweh versus Adonai, which will be Lord, which is a capital L, but then lowercase L-O-R-D. Okay? That's a little bit confusing. Uh, and there's, there's a history to that, why it's that way. But it's something to pay attention to. Because this is the fear of Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, the revealed God. Yahweh, who revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush, who said, Moses said, who should I say, that when the Pharaoh says, who sent you? Who should I say sent you? He says, tell him I am has sent you. Yahweh. And, and there's much contained in this. When we're talking about the fear of Yahweh, it's not fear in the abstract of God as, as the creator, a deistic view of, of some distant God. It's fear of the God of promise, the God who has revealed himself, the God who we know. And so, so what really in some here, when it's talking about the fear of the Lord, it's talking about that wisdom begins with submission to God's revelation. Submission to that. One of the best definition I found of fear of the Lord came from Charles Bridges. He says, fear of the Lord is that affectionate reverence. Isn't that great? Affectionate reverence. Love and fear mixed together. This, this idea of, of I'm, I'm obeying you because I love you, right? But I revere you because you're still God. So he says it's that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself humbly and carefully to his father's law. I don't obey God out of fear of judgment if I'm in Christ, right? Perfect love does cast out fear. Fear has to do with death. I'm not under punishment anymore. But I obey God and I fear God because I have an affectionate reverence for him. I, I know him. I love him. He is almighty and I, I need to understand that. And so I obey willingly, lovingly. That's what's in mind here with the fear of the Lord. Humility 
is sort of the key thing behind this, right? And we see this because later, the rest of the verse, he says, fools despise wisdom instruction, pride. So the humble, those who humble themselves before this revealed God and say, okay, I'm, I, the beginning of wisdom, I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to submit to you. You leave me on the path. Versus the fool who says, cool path, no thanks, got my own way. That pride. So it's humility versus pride. This is what needs to characterize us, that we humbly submit to God's will. That's what's in mind here with the fear of the Lord. When it's saying that that's the beginning of knowledge, it means that's the starting place, right? You've got to start there. And specifically with the, with the hindsight of being New Testament believers, we, we know that, that what it means to submit to God, what does that mean? It means to submit to Jesus Christ. That's why we call him Lord. He is our master. The, the person who has begun the path of wisdom, it's not wisdom in the abstract of just learning different things and becoming smart. The, the type of wisdom we're talking about here, the path that we want to be on, is the path that begins with bowing the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ, of finding in him the forgiveness for our sins, of trusting in him for that salvation we have through his cross, of, of believing the promises that we have, that he is coming again soon for us, and that we have an inheritance for us, a rich inheritance waiting in heaven. It is the, the glory, it's the center point, it's the, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what he's saying here, how we can interpret this with understanding what truly fearing the Lord looks like as a Christian is that wisdom starts with knowing Jesus Christ. That's where it starts. If you don't know the Lord, there are things that you can become wise in, domains of life that you might really get smart in. But that's only by virtue of you happenstance crisscrossing the true path of wisdom, right? So we've, we've pressed this metaphor a little bit. There's a true path of wisdom that we're to get on that begins with Christ, and then we're to walk in his ways, the walk of faith, step by step, seeking to live his will. It would follow that there might be people out there who accidentally crisscross parts of that path, right? That there are people that don't know the Lord, but in some area of life are very wise, right? This, this is that question that I brought, something that maybe it's never bothered you, but it always bothered me about this passage is, I've known a lot of wise people that aren't Christians. I know people that are wise in business. I know people who give good advice. And I'm like, but you don't know the Lord. How'd you get on this path? And, and that's, that's how I think about it, is that they, they have stumbled across through what we, would, what we call general revelation. So God gives us two types of ways he reveals things to us. We have general revelation, or some people call it natural revelation, that I observe the world and the way it works, and I learn things, right? And, and even that, is, we're told God reveals himself through that. Romans 1 talks about this, Psalm 8, that he reveals his existence and power through what's been made. And so some people, they, 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 they have a, a, an almost fear of God in the abstract because they're like, there is some, something's going on here. They haven't bowed the knee to him. They're like, a hey, God exists. Something's real. But he also reveals other things, even life skills. Isaiah 28, I, I won't have us turn there, but look at this at some point. Isaiah 28, 23 through 29 talks about the farmer. And it goes, who taught the farmer how to farm? And if you look at the, the, the Bible, there's not, I mean, there's farming, but it doesn't tell you when do I plant, when do I harvest. The farmer got wise through looking at general revelation and saying, okay, there's a harvest, there's a good time to plant, experimentation, watching, and learning. And what Isaiah says is God taught the farmer through that general revelation. And so this is part of how we can understand that people can get wise through a, a look, some aspects of wisdom can be found through just observing the way that the world is, the way people are, right? But true wisdom, that wisdom which is from above, has to be complemented by, augmented by special revelation. So general revelation, right? What is created, observing how the world is, we can learn a lot from. But what we need is special revelation. And that is, is God revealing himself like he did to Moses, revealing himself through the prophets and revealing himself in his word. Here we have the specifics. Here there are things we can learn that we couldn't just pick out from creation just by watching the birds for long enough, right? Like the Trinity, <laughs> like all, all these different concepts, the, the gospel itself. You're not going to stumble across that through a jaunt in the woods. God needs to have a special revelation of that. 
And by this special revelation, he helps us be made wise even in the more general areas of life. And this is why, as we read the Proverbs and you get into these, you're like, it's talking about really, really minute things. And you're like, what does this have to do with, with spirituality? It's like that it all does. That, that to live wisely involves being wise in the spirit, discerning spiritual things, but it also trickles down into every area of your life, how you conduct yourself at work, how, how you, you wisely approach managing your own home, even just little stuff of life. There's wisdom to that that you can grow in. And what happens is when you have the, the testimony of general revelation of what God has shown us in the world, and we're looking at, we're observing, we're learning from that, trying to grow wise from that, but then you layer on top of it this lens of special revelation, now it all comes into focus. It all makes sense. And, and you can understand to a degree that the un, even the unbeliever can't, the things of the world. Let me, let me try to drive this home just by way of, of contrast. There are, there are scientists, right, who are very wise that don't know the Lord, right? I, I, think, of, I think of a guy like, like Richard Dawkins, who is, is a great biologist, and he makes some great observations. But when he turns to start interpreting those observations, he comes to foolish conclusions, he, he, he doesn't believe in a God. He, he, he believes in, in evolutionary biology. And, and even you'll hear people who press in on things they've observed from general revelation and try to draw conclusions apart from the, the biblical worldview, the special revelation, and they come to insane conclusions. Right now, in the month of June, there's a program on NBC called Queer Planet. It's a nature show about homosexual animals. This isn't a recommendation, <laughs> not an endorsement. The point is, w the whole premise of the show is, you know, the, these animals do these things. This, this fish, uh, what's the Nemo fish called? The clownfish? Yeah. Apparently that changes sexes sometimes throughout its life cycle. And so they say, look at all this that means that it's okay that we do those things, right? Think about what an insane conclusion that is. If the animals do it, it's probably morally right for us. Animals kill each other. Animals eat their young. I, I kind of pride myself on not being an animal. <laughs> I'm a little bit above them. But this is what I mean, is apart from special revelation, apart from the wisdom that is above, from above, you can get this wisdom for the world through observation and you can make it a little ways onto the path. You can learn in certain areas and, and be really smart in that area. But you lose the thread real fast if you start drawing conclusions apart from a biblical worldview. Does that make sense? And so the wisdom that's in Proverbs is this kind that, that blends special and general revelation. Even when we heard in the scripture reading that Solomon wrote stuff about trees and about different animals, and you're like, what? Why is he writing about animals? Because that's part of it. God's given us this, this grand vista of revelation. And I think as, as the secularists make this error of, the, the grave error of ignoring special revelation, I sometimes worry that we in the church make the error of ignoring somewhat general revelation. That, that we don't pay attention to the world around us as much. And maybe this is a, a byproduct of modernity. We, we're in our homes and, and we've got our, our, our air conditioning and, and we don't really pay attention to creation as much except for the Windows desktop because it's a nice, beautiful vista. But because of that, if we divorce ourselves from being wise to observe, being wise to consider, hey, this is God's world and all that's in it. We, we, we lose some of the the texture and the beauty of how God shows himself and how we can comport ourselves to how the world actually is and live wisely within it. And, and I, would, I would love to see a resurgence of, of Christians in the sciences. That's something I think about. You think, think about, in, in all the times you think about with mathematics, Blaise Pascal, or you think about Isaac Newton, who invented calculus just so he could do what he was doing better, invented entire mathematics. You might not like, like math, but these guys liked math because they loved the Lord. And I think that this is something where, where we've sort of turned over this whole area of, of practical wisdom, the secularists who don't know the Lord. When here we have the interpretive lens to see the big picture. We, we should pay attention to general revelation in, through the lens of special revelation. 
And we do that by approaching all of our lives under the fear of the Lord. So that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the start. That's the trailhead. Start with Christ. If you don't know the Lord, you might be able to be wise in some area of this or that, but you're not going to be wise in the way that actually matters and the way that actually leads to life evermore. And that's the ultimate wisdom. So what if you're wise in business and you make a killing in this life? You're not taking it with you. Your riches perish with you. So what if you're wise and you gain status and respect from all these people and you die in your sin? The wise take the long view. They say there's an eternity. There's a judgment that's coming. And I want to be on the right side of that. And the right side of that is standing behind Jesus Christ and bowing the knee to him and beginning with the fear of the Lord. So as wise as you think you are, you are not even begun if you don't know the Lord. And so my challenge to you, my plea to you, if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ today, get on the path, repent to your sin, bow the knee and trust in him. Because what we don't want to be is the fool. The fool, it says in the latter part of verse seven here, despise wisdom and instruction. They despise it. Like I said, they they see the path, they hear the truth, they hear the wisdom, and they say, I don't want it. Despise means they regard it as worthless, vile, contemptible. They spit on it. This is the heart of, of saying, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to carve a path through this world and I don't care what you, the creator of the world, tells me is the right way to live. That's why it's foolish. It's not just wicked, it's dumb. But even if you aren't the fool, the fool is the unbeliever, by the way, if that's not clear. But if you aren't the fool, even those who are on the path may be tempted and drawn away from the path of wisdom by foolish people. And this brings us to our fourth and, and final key to getting and staying on the path. And here's really the emphasis of this is stay on the path. And this is the warning. This is verses eight through 19. The warning. Just to stick with the hiking analogies or the hiking illustrations. Uh, we were at the Grand Canyon uh, one time. My, my wife and I, we were, we were walking through the Grand Canyon and there are lots of warning signs there as there should be. Uh, one of my favorite ones is as you hike down into the canyon, there's these signs and it's like a picture, a really overly detailed, in my opinion, picture of a guy who's like laying on the ground and his skin's all red and blistered and he's upchucked a little. And this is a picture and, the, and it just says, make sure you're drinking water. I'm like, guys, just say drink water. <laughs> like, I don't need that. It was a stern warning. But there's other warnings too. The Grand Canyon, it's not all fenced in. It'll be an expensive fencing project. It's grand for a reason. And people fall in, lots of people every year. And so there's signs along the way that say, stay on the path. And that's what Solomon's saying here. We switch here to this first discourse in verses 8 through 19, where uh, the the words are put in the mouth of a father speaking to his son. And the son is sort of a, a representative of the youth, right? That category of people who are on the path of wisdom. This would be believers that are on the path of wisdom, but we're not quite to maturity. We have some ways to go. And he's issuing us some warnings and the key message, stay on the path, because there's going to be people who seek, who seek to draw you off from it. We're going to hear uh, next week about a a warning and a call to the simple, that other character. But first, we'll look today at uh, at the son, at the youth. So it starts with this exhortation. Look at verses eight and nine. Hear, my son, your father's instruction, and forsake not your mother's teaching. For they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. So he gives this, this motivation. He's like, listen to us, your parents. And the parents in this are, 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 are the, the ones who are teaching the wisdom. And, 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 and don't get wrong here if you're like, well, my parents aren't believers. Or my parents are even in my life. And like, they never taught me wisdom. They taught me the wrong way. The, the point is that they are, the, these are characters. They're representing those who teach you wisdom. And he's saying, don't ignore that. As you, as you get older in life, as you grow from, from youth into maturity, there is a temptation to kind of start to be like, yeah, that's what they said, but I know better now, right? You guys have teenagers? <laughs> and he's saying, don't forsake the wisdom. Don't leave the path. Why? The first reason he says is for, they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. 
You're like, oh, a little outfit. No, the, the idea is a graceful garland. This is an attractive, it's, it's like a laurel wreath that you'd, you would win if you, if you won in an ancient competition. It, it speaks of life, of victory, of overcoming. He's saying the wisdom itself, the instructions you've learned, it's precious, it's valuable. And he doesn't say because of what it does for you. He says wisdom's good by itself. It's a precious thing. Like those verses we read earlier, more precious than rubies or gold or silver. It's a graceful garland of your head or pendants for your neck. It's a necklace. It's an adornment. It's a symbol of honor, of life. So crave wisdom for its own sake, but also because it holds you back from error. Look here in verses 10 through 19. We'll work through these. Uh, he's saying you're not in a neutral environment. You're not in a neutral environment, right? If you grew up, you had the blessing of growing up in a godly household. Maybe this was how it was characterized, is you had good teaching. You sat under good teaching at, at a good church that taught the Bible. But then as you go out into the world, there are people who are saying, here's a different way, here's a different way. And you said, well, they told me it was this path. And they're saying, I know a shortcut. I know a shortcut. Don't, you don't need to stay on that path. There's an easier way to get this. And so what happens here in this, in this made-up story that, that Solomon's giving here is that the peers offer a shortcut to wealth in violation of the law, in violation of what's right. He's saying, hey, wisdom at the end of the path, right? And, and we, we'll talk about this more in coming weeks, but wisdom offers so many benefits to life. Wise wise people, th th there's blessing that follows, it, often in this life temporally, but guaranteed in the next life. And what the fools will come along and say is there's an easier way to get that. Don't go the long way. Cut through the woods here. And like with all sin, what is offered is a counterfeit of real blessing. Isn't that right? There is a real and true riches, which is precious to us, right? There is, next week we'll look at one, the, the temptation to go off in search of, of relationship, in search of sexual gratification off of the path, Right? There are real means of these blessings. It isn't as if God says with sin, all those things are bad because you like them. It's that God has a right way for us to enjoy the blessings and the pleasures of this life. And what sin says is there's an easier way. And it's lying. And it's laying a trap for you. Just like these kids in this story. Look at verse 10. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. So he's saying, if people come along and invite you off of the path, don't listen. If they offer you excitement or easy money or fellowship, don't follow them. It's a trap. Verse 11, if they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. And who hasn't received such an invitation? <laughs> so it's a little bit like over the top. You read this and you're like, huh, don't know if this applies. <laughs> like I've not been invited to a, a murder. Um, the, the point with the way that Solomon lays this out, and it's so like overt, like how wicked what they're doing is, is he's putting on the lips of these, these characters in his story what's truly going on at the heart level, right? He's raising it up because when it comes to us, the temptation, it comes much more beautifully packaged, doesn't it? And what you'll see is the reason that they want to lie and wait and ambush and do all this stuff is because they want to steal from these people. And, and, and so for a minute, back up and get, what, what's the big picture he's talking about? He's saying there's people that are going to offer you easy money. That's, that's the main point here. They're going to offer you easy money. They're going to offer you excitement. That's part of the attraction of, of this lie and wait for him. Like, he's like, oh yeah, I want to be part of this scheme. You know, that's, it's, it's something exciting. It's something different. You notice too, that they start by saying, come with us. Since the beginning, even with, with Satan's temptation, it, it, it starts with always, hey, come. Come do this thing. It's never, hey, you, go do that thing. And you're like, alone? No, it's always, hey, join us. Sinners love company. And, and often temptation comes wrapped in this guise of false fellowship of, well, I'll be doing it with them. I don't have to feel as guilty about it because I got a group of people. The guilt will spread out between us, right? It's never you go do that. It's let's do that together. And so it makes it even more enticing. It exploits the, the, the God-designed desire we have for fellowship, doesn't it? This is why gangs are attractive, right? G gang culture. Like, why would someone join with this violent group? Because it's a group. I want to be a part of something. 
And so you need to be wary of that. And so they set the ambush. This is cold and calculating thing Solomon lays out. No chance for the person to defend themselves. Verse 12, like Sheol, that's death. Let us swallow them alive and whole, like those who go down to the pit. And and the, the point there is just to exacerbate how brutal they're talking here is they're like, we're not just going to rob the person and beat them up a little. We're going to utterly destroy them just to, to show how wicked what's being offered here to verse 13. And we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. There's the reason for the brutality. There's the reason for the cheating. There's the reason. Easy money, greed. That's why we do it. Verse 14, throw in your lot among us. We will all have one purse, right? That camaraderie again. So again, you got to zoom out a little bit and think, okay, this may not be offered to me in this form, but we face temptations for greed like this, don't we? Cheat a little on the taxes. Don't report that. Why don't you have to report that thing? They didn't send you a, I don't know what the forms are called, but you know, like you have that temptation of, I'll just cut a little bit here. I'll cheat a little bit there. It's fine. It's fine. I'll take the money under the table, right? The greed that's behind that is what leads you to violate God's law, this quest for easy money. The antidote is to to be content with what the Lord gives you here and moreover to be content in faith and trusting the promises of walking with the Lord. That blessedness is better than the cheap money, than the easy money, than the greed, than the stealing that what awaits us is far better. Um, And so here the father offers a rebuttal. If you hear this, these invitations, and sometimes for us, these come internally, right? The temptation to do something. Someone's not standing there saying, hey, come join me in this. It's it's our own wicked hearts. But here's what the father says to do, 15 through 18. My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back for your foot from their paths. There's that path imagery. You can see it. Don't walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot. There's almost this image of, of the, the, the son, the youth, walking on the path of wisdom, and then someone's going from behind a tree. Come on, I know a quicker way. And you start. He says, hold back your foot. Hold it back. It's a force of will sometimes, isn't it? it God empowers us to, to uh, resist temptation, doesn't he? By his Holy Spirit. But it also involves a force of our will. And I think very often we, we faced with these temptations to say, ah, it's just too attractive. I'm just going to do it. And Solomon says to the youth, just don't. It's, it's God who's empowering you to do it. Of course, approach it with prayer. But th- I'm, so I'm speaking of temptation more generally here. You have to exert a force of will and say, no, that's the wrong way. Fight the sin. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. That's why it's a fight. Hold back your foot. Because what lies that way is evil. Verse 16, for their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed blood. So the first reason you want to hold back from these shortcuts is it's wrong. That what they do for the shortcuts is to violate God's law, to sin. So that's a good reason. I don't want to do it. But it's not just wrong. It's stupid. Verse 17, for in vain is a net shed and spread in the light, in the sight of any bird. What's he talking about here? So a fowler, somebody who catches birds. He's saying, somebody who would go and hunt birds knows I don't lay the net down while the birds are up in the tree watching me because they're going to be like, Psst, George, that's a trap. Let's not eat the food out of it. His point is, those who choose these shortcuts are dumber than birds because even the birds know, hey, don't go in the trap if you saw it. He says, verse 18, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. It's like you laying out the trap and then be like, oh, there's candy. You know, you just put it there. That's the problem. It's dumb. That's why they're called fools. The, the fools throughout the problems, when it talks about the fool, the fool, the fool, you're like, they're, they're, they're just wicked. They're, sin- they're, they're choosing their own way. But the reason they call him the fool is because it's not just wrong, it's dumb. It's dumb. You hurt yourself. And so he's, he's offering all these persuasions to the, to the young of saying, hey, hold back your foot from the wicked path. Not, it should be good enough that it's wrong. But for no other reason, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt yourself. You're going to be like Wiley e. Coyote trying to catch the, 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 what is that thing? The road runner. And then it always backfires or like that. The guy who jams the the stick in the spokes of his own bike while he's riding it. It's a self-own, as they say on the internet. Don't do that. Don't lay a trap for yourself. 
In verse 19, such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. There's the moral. There it is all summed up. You do wrongly and you do stupidly when you are motivated by greed. Don't go that way. Stay on the path. It's not just wrong. It's foolish. Those who heed wisdom, they remember that at the end of all things, there is a judge. And while they might make some short-term gains in this life by cheating, it will come back to bite you in this life, but most certainly in the life to come. Numbers 20, 32, 23 summarizes as well. But if you will not do so, behold, you've sinned against the Lord and be sure your sin will find you out. Galatians 6, 7, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Or Johnny Cash, you can run on for a long time, run on for a long time, but sooner or later, God will cut you down. This is a warning. It's a warning. Stay on the path. So let me just finish with a couple points of, of application here. If you're, you're listening to this, and you're thinking, boy, I might be the fool. I might be choosing my own way through this world. I might be even sitting here in church and thinking, man, th th there's the, the, the way of Jesus, and they're saying I should follow him, and that way lies forgiveness of sin, eternal blessedness. Yeah, but I want to do my own thing. That makes you the fool. And the charge for you, as I said earlier, is to repent. The best thing to do is to turn from that wrong path and get on the right path. And the right path begins with Jesus Christ. The right path comes through that narrow gate who is the way, the truth, and the life. Repent to your sins and trust in him and get on the path of wisdom. If you are the simple, you're, you're like, hey, I know there's the path, but I haven't really been paying attention. <laughs> I'm, the challenge to you is to get on the path, is to come to Christ. You say, look, I'm, I'm not antagonistic to the gospel. I just kind of don't care. Pay heed to the warning. You need to care. Because though you might be, not be as obstinate as the fool, you're headed to the same place. You're really on the same path, aren't you? Because you haven't started with Christ. If you are the young, if you are the one who are on the path, you have trusted in Jesus Christ, you are growing in maturity, the challenge to you as it is here right in the text is stay on the path. There are temptations marking the way. Those who will seek to pull you aside, temptation, so many wonderful things to indulge in. And you think, ah, but isn't it good enough? I stay on the path, then I wander a little bit, then I stay on the path. No, you are hurting yourself and you're sinning against God. Get on the path, stay on the path. And finally, I would just say this to those who are the wise. You, are, you have grown in the faith. Perhaps you are aged because you have lived this life and observed and grown and you are wise. Keep gaining wisdom as it said in the start. But here's my challenge to you. Share it. Share the wisdom. We need it. We, I'll speak for myself. We're a foolish generation. And we need the wisdom for those who have gone before us. And the riches of that wisdom is not something to be hoarded but to be passed on. Pass it on to your children, to your grandchildren. Disciple someone in the church. Older men, choose some younger men to pour into. Give them wisdom, point them to God's word. Help them just to live life and be wise. Older women, Titus too, right? Find some younger women and give your life. And you say, ah, it's a big obligation. It's a lot of time. Yeah, it is. But it's a big treasure that you have. Please share it. Please share it with us. And all of us, let us get on the path and stay on the path. Pray with me. Dear Father, we are so grateful that you have revealed yourself to us, that you've not left us in this world without a witness, that you've shown us through what you've made, that you are powerful, that you are glorious and should be served, but you didn't leave us there. You gave us special revelation. You opened our eyes through the prophets and through the scriptures to the wisdom that it is in Christ Jesus, that we might be saved from our rebellion, from that wrong path that we all begin on and might trust in him and follow in the way that leads to life evermore. I pray for those who do not know the Lord today, Lord, that are listening to this, convict them by your Holy Spirit cause them to see their sin for the grievous error that it is and to repent and trust in you and get on the path. And for those who are on the path, those who know you, Lord, encourage us 
Help us to see this is not just the right way, but the best way, even for us, even in this life, as there are many troubles, that it's still best to stay on this path. Hold us to it and help us to hold one another to it as well. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.